Well done, Bobby Charlton. Well done, Manchester United. Beckham. It's a shearing up. And so far it's played. Bobby Sharp saved it. United again. Ready. Hello listener and welcome to United R, your official RedCafe.net podcast on all things Manchester United. I'm your host Colin. And I'm David. How's the form David? Yeah, not bad, bad, not bad, can't complain. Staying at a beautiful sunset right now after an amazing uh, 3-0 victory again. Uh, oh, things are looking good but how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm good too, I haven't got a sunset. Um, but other than that, no complaints. Um, yeah, we're recording just immediately after um, our three 0 victory against Villa away. Um, it was a fantastic result, and um, we are literally just finished with the um, some pre- post match comments there, and we're getting straight into it. Um, Dave, not a bad again, not a bad, not a bad evening's viewing, was it? No, not the worst at all. And I mean, the statistic that the commentators were saying at the end that that's the the first time in Premier League history. That a team has won four games in a row with a margin of three goals or better hasn't happened in the Premier League before. And I had to check that stat, but it turns out it's accurate. Never happened before. Yeah, I think that, that it's probably fair to say then that we're the best team the Premier League has ever seen. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder is that is that influenced by COVID? Do you think because the games are coming so thick and fast? We're in such a good vein of form, but everyone, you know, that can't be said for every team, and certainly not for all the teams we faced um, in this kind of pretty nice run yeah. um, nice in, in terms of how good we've been playing but also nice in terms of who we've been playing and what they've looked like and also I think the subs and the, the amount of subs you can make and I think that plays hugely into our hands as well so you know do you think just before we get into the game do you think normal times we would have put this run together you know assuming that all the same things happened in terms of Paul will come back Rash will come back you know how much of it is just us being class at football now or how much of it comes down to the kind of post lockdown on state of football, no fans and all that kind of stuff? It's a bit of a mixture of like so many things and I think the, the opposition has to come under question as well because it looks like we had a better three months off than pretty much any other team in world football. It looks like we got the, the fitness right, we got the, um, the off the field stuff in terms of like giving back and being seen to helping and that camaraderie, like that seemed to be right. Other teams, like, I mean, I know we're, we're going to touch more on this later, but just as one guy in the Aston Villa team who got in a bit of bother during the lockdown. So it's almost like the mentality during the last three months. It seems like ours was just stronger and more focused than everyone else. I mean, both us and Villa today, there's a lot to play for. We're chasing Champions League and Aston Villa are chasing survival in the league. But the, the difference in the, the way they seem the teams wanted it almost, and we were just better mentally prepared. So I think that the the message at the beginning of COVID was, we don't know how long this is going to last, but whenever foot, football comes back, we're going to be ready. And if you're not ready, you're not going to be part of this team. And I think Solskjaer has done a great job of that. The guys who really got stuck in during the, um, the three months off, they're being rewarded for it. And you've seen it on the pitch, like how many times in a row has that has put the same lineup out? Right, and it's guys who are performing who really have knuckled down during these last three months. It's awesome to see, but as we were on a good run before COVID as well, and we were in the process of getting Pogba back and eventually getting Rashford back and having no injuries and a more settled team. Mm. So it's kind of it's hard to say for sure, but we were on an upturn. I mean, this is the the trend before COVID. We looked better, yeah, and we're just kind of carried on from where we left off but with like the added almost bonus that other teams have slacked off mentally I think that's very clear to see I think the gap between the top of the table and the bottom of the table is bigger than it's ever been after COVID like I'm seeing some pretty poor performances from the team at the bottom which you don't normally see in this week No you kind of I mean and we've kind of been lining up relegation fodder after relegation fodder after um, Sheffield United and Spurs but you kind of expect these games to be these hard fought down to the wire, them given everything, and it's just not at the moment working out that way, and um, beyond kind of the first twenty minutes. But you mentioned there, um, the unchanged lineup. Obviously, we were maybe not concerned is the right word. We were wondering whether uh, Lindelof would be able to start, whether we'd see Ekbay come in, and just generally. I mean, were you expecting a bit of rotation, or were you pretty confident that he was going to name the same lineup again for I think the fourth game in a row? No, I was expecting a bit of rotation, and that's one of those positions like. Whoever plays there, I can take it or leave it because we know the strengths and weaknesses of them both. 
Um, I think Lindelof, since the return, has looked... Obviously, he's started more games, so he's a bit more of a sure thing. Mm -hmm. But given uh, Villa's... They don't have too much of a threat up top. So whoever was going to be in there, I wasn't too concerned that we were going to be under too much pressure. And did you expect any changes at the top of the pitch? Absolutely none, I think. <laughs> uh, I mean, after listening to what, the, the podcast last week, talking about those three up front, and it, can, it just picks itself at the moment, right? The midfield picks itself as well. It's just... When we're going at teams, the balance of those, you call them a front five, it, it's just teams are um, teams are struggling to deal with that right now. Like the threat is coming from every angle of the pitch and with Fernandez and Pogba striding forward. It's just, it used to be that teams kind of thought, oh, well, you know what, these players might be bigger and they might be better, but if we get in their face and stop them playing, their impact in the game will be less. Now they're just like, all of them are taking a bit of scruff yeah. of the neck and just, they're, they're living up to their expectation and they're just better football players, you know? Well, the other, well that's, that's the absolute baseline, which I think sometimes we probably talk too much about things that don't really matter and that's one of those things that really just does matter. Um, but one of the things that, are, that I just want to pick you up on is it's not even that all those players are all playing well at the same time. They don't even need to. You know, previously I think teams would have worked so hard to make sure that they just gave Dan James the ball. Yeah. When he has it, we let him have it. When Aaron wan is attacking with the ball and Dan James is around him, you know, pretty much let them work away. Try and actually funnel Manchester United down to that, that flank. And why we saw such a lopsided attack of always going down this right-hand channel that wasn't ever really working out that well for us. And that was a clear tactic the teams used to try and employ. Not just with Dan James. I just picked him as an example. You know, it happened with lots of players. It was Pereira, Lingard, whatever else. Mata. Certain players that they just felt comfortable wouldn't hurt them. And now... I think teams have to give so much respect to that whole front four and almost the most respect to Greenwood now in this current um, moment. But, you know, you can't just let Rashford have it, even though he's been, you know, average by his own high standards since the return of lockdown, or sorry, the return of football post-lockdown. You know, when Martial's maybe not on the ball, you still just can't say, oh, well, we're happy for him to have it. There's no player there you're happy to have it. So teams are on a knife edge, I think, throughout the whole 90 minutes. And even though all those four players aren't necessarily all having great games all at the same time, because they aren't, you know, um, it doesn't matter because the threat's always there. And that's that's such a huge thing. Um, yeah, I, I was glad he didn't change the lineup, obviously. Um, I think it's so hard to at the moment. I think every game is so important in terms of this top four finish that I just don't think you can afford at all to, to, to mix with something that is so far from broken. Um, it's untrue. So, you know, and we've seen the difference when, when um, Scott and Fred come in and stuff like that, who I think are the only two with real, you know, po possibly justifiable grievances of being left out, you know. Um, but it's just so hard to make that switch now. You know, and, and Ole has gone on record before in terms of saying, if you're a Manchester United player, you should expect to play 60 games a year and you should be able to cope with that, you know, and he's, he's previously shown that he's quite happy to almost run players into the ground if he thinks that's what he needs to do, um, which we've questioned before. But in this instance, I think it's actually probably probably a buy more approach, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100% with that. Um, first 20 minutes of the game weren't, weren't that awesome, though. How did you, I mean, that was a pretty slow start, which I think we've seen maybe the last game as well. We were pretty slow to start as well, if I recall. Um is that a concern or is that just the way it is? I mean, Villa were pretty combative for the first 25 minutes and probably the better team. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. They're, they're the better team. And I think there was, in those first 20 minutes, I think a lot of fans probably felt this way. Is it was like, oh no, here we go. It's, it's been too good to be true. There's a few players being a bit sloppy on the ball. Like, you know, Pogba gave it away in a dangerous, dangerous mm. area a couple of times. You know, oh, here we go again with Pogba. Like, it's, here comes the... You get, couple of 9 out of 10 performances, now here comes a 4 out of 10 one. It just kind of looked all familiar, but for some reason, like, I didn't have that that dread that I normally have when we start a game like that. That's what you want when you're watching your football team, isn't it? That, that great sense of dread, you know? <laughs> for, but for the past, like, three, four years, that's what it's been like. When a team, yeah. like, a, with all due respect, a smaller team like Aston Villa, when they get a foothold in the game, like, just go back to last season. We we'd be expecting them to score, and then us maybe struggle to get a draw. Like that was the expectation almost. Whereas this time, I just felt that you know, it's there. I mean, the, the fans aren't there, but they're still at home. They're playing for their lives. They're they need to stay in the in the Premier League, and for so many reasons these days. I mean, I, I don't know what it's obviously it's bad whenever you drop them to the Championship financially under normal circumstances, but now 
potentially catastrophic for any team. So they're fighting for their lives. And I just I kind of just put it down to that and Man United trust in that as long as we don't go a goal down or we don't give anything too stupid away, eventually the quality is going to tell. And I think that's exactly what we saw by the time all was said and done. Yeah, it is true. I mean, there were a few sort of issues in that first 20 minutes. I thought Aaron wan had a very ropey 20 minutes. Um, they were certainly seeming to target him with these sort of big balls to the back post where he, he just didn't look that positionally comfortable in terms of where he should have needed to be. He kept tucking it's in the side. It's the only way to off. target him. You yeah. can't target him any other way. You target him on the ground, you're nine times out of ten, he's, you're not going to beat him, right? So yeah. as a viable tactic, he's not the tallest and not the best in the air. Yeah, I also think he just, I don't even know this, because he's not small for a fullback by any stretch of the imagination. He's definitely not a natural header of the ball. Um, but I think it's a positional thing. I just think he still doesn't, and this, you know, he's a super young player and, and a young defender that hasn't played there um, throughout his um youth career. But I just think he does get a bit lost sometimes. And, and, and there was... I mean, Grealish got in with one on the side foot, which which was a, a difficult chance that he blazed over. Um, and there was sort of a few headers at the back post that just looked like there were going to be a wee bit susceptible. Well, I thought generally we just looked quite leggy and, you know, almost, you know, it's it's kind of feels pointless to talk about given we know what happened in the 60, 70 minutes afterwards, but almost looked like we were kind of buying into our own hype a little bit that we thought we just had to come here and kind of uh, strode around and, and the sexy football would just happen. You know, it, a lot of players seemed, I thought, to be very much staying in first gear and just just you know i thought bruno looked a bit frustrated trying to kind of cajole people and to maybe giving a bit more doing a bit more and um, but truthfully it, it, it didn't last that long although it did culminate as you mentioned and i think it was it might have been trezgar el ghazi who um i think it was john mcginn robbed um pogba yep and, and, and broke in and, and it just opened up i think the defenders in fairness didn't did the right thing and not committing to the man with the ball and leaving um, the kind of channel slip through ball open but it ended up he was just kind of at the edge of the box and, and, and tried to just bend it around um, the head hitting the post and to me that was like a little bit of a shot in the arm for us um, but I mean that goes in it's a different game Dave yeah, I, I mean the, you're, you're right and like obviously the decision that I'm sure we're about to talk about is what ultimately swung it in our favour which is just shortly there after them hitting the post but I mean that's what I'm saying like with Pogba you were just you were going back to what he what we're kind of used to seeing with him is trying something clever in the middle of the park with too many opposition players around him. And then, I mean, John McGinn is, uh, he's pretty good at getting his foot in there and nicking the ball away. You just don't want to be doing that around that guy. And then, you know, they, they score that goal and do the heads drop? Like, because it, it's weird when we played against Bournemouth and it was kind of when they scored, you had that feeling of, oh, don't worry, everything will be okay. But I feel like we had be been playing better up till that point, whereas against Villa today, we had been quite poor, and them scoring would have been a fair reflection on the way the game had went, so I wonder how our heads would have been, but, I mean, ultimately, it, it doesn't matter in the end. It didn't matter, yeah. <laughs> it didn't matter, and I just, yeah. I hope that, we just need to see Pogba get that out of his game, because, like, some of the stuff he'd done today, some of the passes, like, it's it just looks so normal. I mean, yeah, him. I mean, like, I think there's such a, uh, Paul Pogba plays the different standards, held the different standards than almost anyone else. And, and uh, you know, as United fans, I think we're, we're super guilty of that. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because he's an exceptionally talented footballer. Um, and, it, you know, to start the podcast, to start the podcast off kind of criticising him it is maybe a bit unfair because, as we'll touch on later, I mean, he was, for me, man of the match, uh, absolute Rolls Royce performance. Um, but, I mean, after that, we did. We went and won the pen. Um, it, oh, that's that's a very generous call, it's, won it's, the pen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We were given the pen. We were gifted the pen. Bruno created a pen. Um, a pen was awarded for something that may have actually just been a foul on their player. And um, before we actually get to that um, contentious decision, I thought Mason in the, in the build up to to the penalty um, did fantastically well. Just yep. took the ball and um, was back to goal. Turned his man, kind of fought past him with I think again a little exhibition of that increased strength and, and kind of uh, physicality that we're seeing from him um, post lockdown, and then just hard on down the pitch and um, really broke sort of 30 or 40 yards drew defenders in and then i think involved um marshall slip marshall in behind with a nice little ball um, and then it was marshall who eventually turned out and, and led it off to bruno who who drew the pen but for me greenwood was kind of the shining light in that first 20 minutes he, he looked the one who was most engaged the one who was happy to take the ball and, and be, be as direct as we're now used to seeing him and I thought he was the catalyst, catalyst to win that pen. In goes Fernandez. Oh, this foul right on the edge of the area. Penalty given. It was 
Esri Konsa, who brings down Fernandez. Is that a pen for you? No chance. Never. No, not a million years. Not a million years. If that happened against you, I know we don't tend to swear on this podcast, so I won't, but you would be <laughs> effing raging if that happened would. against you. I can, to- I can totally understand why it was given. I cannot for the life of me understand why it wasn't overturned. Like, fair enough, give it. But to have a look at that, like, this is where VAR just can never be perfect because you, there's someone in a room who sees the total opposite side of the spectrum and that's, well, if if the Aston Villa player doesn't have his leg there, does Bruno get the ball? And, like, I, I don't know what's come through their mind, but the, the defender done nothing wrong whatsoever. Bruno puts his foot over the ball and goes into him. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm going to play the devil's eye. I can sort of see both sides, but for me, it's not a penalty, first of all, or at least it, you know, I can see that it maybe is a penalty, but it's extreme. I mean, it's, it's, it's Plato in terms of being soft, but real time, I assumed, my first thought was foul by Bruno. Seeing it real time, I thought he had, the ball was run away from I thought he reached and something that you sometimes do when the ball's run away from you to try and style it out you try and go for the roll you know to sort of swing past the person even though you've kind of overran it and I thought he just went for it and it just didn't come off I thought it was obvious that he'd la- gone down on your man's shin um, and at the time you know at real speed I didn't think he was in control of the ball um, and in that case I think then he's he's the one creating dangerous play by basically standing on your man the slow mo, and this is where VAR sometimes doesn't help. Um, the slow mo kind of changes it up a wee bit because the two things that I noticed from that angle was that the defender actually does slightly lunge in with his foot. He actually tries to make a challenge, whereas live time I didn't think that was necessarily the case. So he lunges in, kind of not studs up, but he's, he's lunged in, and in the end he makes contact with the back of Bruno, although Bruno still landed on him. And the other point is that Bruno actually maintain control of the ball so if the, if the player if the defender isn't there Bruno simply has the ball on the edge of the box under control you know so he never really actually lost control of it which throws it up in the air for me I still don't think it's a pen I don't think it's even a 50-50 one I think it's more like a 85-15 one or something like that it's a bit ridiculous but as you say about VAR and we touched on it last week it's this clear and obvious thing you know that's that's the issue is that actually VAR may as well not exist because the the VAR assistant is showing time and time again that it would take the most amazing of circumstances for them to go against the the ruling on the field. In which case, why are we even bothered them with three minutes of of replays? You know, to me, it's just self defeat. I think they really need to iron out that part of the rule. You know, the technology is fine; it shows the incident again, and they can all have a look at it. But the relationship between the the VAR referee and the referee on the pitch needs to be really much more closely scrutinised for me. Um, in terms of their willingness to contradict each other, their willingness to go and view it on the sideline and their willingness to get away from this clear and obvious thing because what what the hell is clear and obvious and when will it ever be introduced, you know? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so subjective. It's, you know, I, I've never been a fan of VAR. I, I just, I mean, I don't have enough vested interest in the game to really care too much about the outcomes other than obviously I hope decisions go for Man United. But to me, decisions like that always evened themselves out over the course of the season. But then when you look at us, we've now had 13 penalties this season. Well, 13 in the league. I think we've had like 19 in all competitions. Which is, which is the, the most ever in the Premier League, I think, in one season. And, and a lot of them are VAR decisions not being overturned. That are yeah. kind of soft, right? I could see why other teams would look and say, VAR has benefited Man United. And off the back of that today... Like hundred percent, like no VAR. I mean, the guy gives sure the ref gives a penalty, but absolutely. Although the other thing I would say is, I mean, if you look at Liverpool, VAR has on numerous occasions not award penalties to Mo Salah diving, and that's yep. for me a, a positive side. That you know, where where those possibly would have been given as penalties last year or the year before, and we you know we've witnessed that several times. And I don't mean to single him out. Earlier. I do think he's a bit of a diver, and um, but. Those penalties would have been so. So it is good in that sense. And most of our penalties, yes, some of them might have been quite soft or 50 50s, but there's always a case for it. I mean, you can argue the toss kind of thing. You know, that's probably the worst one we've had all season. Um, but it reminds me, I can't remember when it was, but there was a season where we scored like nine own goals or something. And I like it went, our, our top scorers were like Rooney, someone, own goal, someone, someone, someone. <laughs> and everyone was like running around getting an own goal printed on the back of United shirts. And I yep. feel like 
we I feel like we should either print VAR or Peno on the back of a shirt or something like that for this year because that's a huge amount. And now we haven't just been amazing at converting them all. Um, but this one was dispatched by Bruno Novala. Dispatched by him and for the second time in a row, just a like the way I would take a penalty, run and kick the ball into the net without <laughs> any type of start <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah, I, and I'd like I'm wondering, has he um has he said or has anything came out over why he changed his his technique? Well, I think he just mixes it up. I think we'll see that stutter jump Jorginho thing um, again, to be honest. Um, although you do look a fool when it goes wrong. But I mean, this way he took about three steps. It was a real short run-up and he just he just popped it away. Yeah, it was identical to his, his penalty last week. Just boom, bottom left corner. Like, keeper, yeah. no chance. Easy peasy. Yeah. But the way a penalty should be taken. And it returned to him, obviously, after giving Rashford the one um, at Bournemouth, which I mean, I think we all knew was just a confidence booster um, kind of thing. Yeah. But it, it was nice again to see that I think Bruno should be taken you know eight or nine out of every 10 penalties you know and provided he's on the pitch so um that was great from that point on it was very hard to see where the trouble was going to come from in this game you know it just and i feel like the players felt that there was a, a collective sigh of relief and just a oh could and you know we can just kind of bring out the confidence a little bit not that we were it wasn't a confident start but it, it just wasn't really working out but i think after that it was just like huh, you know that's that's grand. We're probably going to score more goals than you know Villa haven't been that great scoring goals this year. So from then on, I mean, you just felt pretty comfortable, didn't you, Dave? Yeah, the, the the quality just started to tell, and obviously a decision like that going against you, and then the penalty being converted, your head is going to drop. I understand that, and then once you start chasing the ball, it's kind of like it only looked like there was going to be one outcome at one one nil, and yeah, that's that's the way it turned out. Sure is. And I mean, one of the things that's been really pleasing to me lately, I mean, we had against Bournemouth going one nil down and then having that comeback, but not over the course of 90 minutes, within the half, which to me is a hugely impressive sign of where the team's at. Um, the score, I think it was three against Bournemouth um, in the half and a very late goal, the stunner by Marshall. We kind of saw the same thing in this game where you're kind of, you know, you're sitting at one nil, you're watching and you're looking at the clock 20 minutes, 30 minutes and you're like, oh, do you know, a goal before half time would really would really make me feel a lot better. And that's what we got. And I think that ability to, you know, for long times watching United, it looked like we were happy for a game just to pass by. Yeah. You know, like, and games would just pass us by, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes gone. You'd look up the clock suddenly 60, 70 minutes and we, you know, you couldn't even count chances we'd had, you know. Whereas this team, it doesn't seem to be in DNA so much anymore. It wants to go for the throat all the time. There's so many players on the pitch that want to score goals. Um, and, and no player, I think, more so than Mason Greenwood. Greenwood, deep in stoppage time, picks out Martial, shooting chance. Back to Greenwood. Greenwood! Mason Greenwood, he is dynamite! This time with his right boot. What did you make of that second goal? I mean, if, like, first to your point, about, like, we're, we are making stuff happen. I mean, one, um, one of my favourite quotes is about uh, how... It's better when life doesn't happen to you, it happens from you. And it really reminds me of like, the change we've seen in the United team. Like, this is not, the game is not happening to the players on the party, it's now happening from them. Like, they are, they're taking control and playing to their abilities. But Greenwood, I mean, it was obvious he was going to be a standout player like in the youth teams. Like I remember watching him take a like score a free kick with his left and a free kick with his right in like back to back weeks. Mm. And he's just like right, this kid's got something about him. Now every single time he gets the ball, you just have that feeling of something's about to happen. And because he's so good with both feet, the defenders they just don't know what to do. I mean I think it was <laughs> generous defending especially from Tyrone Mings for Greenwood's goal I think they gave him far too much space but the finish is like it's emphatic I mean that's his supposedly not his stronger foot well, and he's, rifle, he's rifled it in like the when Brazilian Ronaldo scored his goal at Old Trafford past Partey it's just yeah. smacked it right with the laces like mid, kind of middle of the net to the right hand side keeper no chance like it's just emphatic, and you almost expect it. And then he had a chance, maybe, I don't know, like five minutes before it on his left foot, where, I mean, it's a good save for the keeper. The ball is heading uh, bottom right corner. Like yeah. everything, he, everything he hits is, 
it's causing problems for the goalkeeper. Well, as, as you say, that um, that chance five minutes before where he, he cut inside, opened up the space, and as soon as he hit it, I, I was out of a seat, you know, or half yep. out of a seat because I just thought that's bottom corner. And in fairness, yep. it was a very good save. The keeper managed to palm it out. Um, I didn't even remember that Pepe Reina was playing for Aston Villa. That was like a complete <laughs> shock to I me. I forgot until seeing him against uh, against Liverpool. I was like, oh, that, oh it's Pepe Reina. Like, I've, I've watched I, a bit I of Villa as well. Napoli. Yeah, I know. I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. Um, but yes, the, the 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 Mason chance before that, which he created himself, he was so direct today in his running. You know, he looked even more confident in terms of taking the ball in the half turn and kind of um, driving in in just a really simple, straightforward way. Where again, I know I said last week, I'll probably say it a million times as we continue to watch Mason Greenwood. But his sole objective is open up spaces for himself to achieve one aim, which is get a shot away. Yep. And the way he does that is not by you know overcomplicating his step overs. Not by taking big, um, heavy touches or anything like that. Everything's economical. Everything's within himself, and everything's under control, even when at extreme speed. And that is just so impressive, as you say. Came off his right, supposedly weaker foot, and it's just such a true strike. I mean, everyone will know what it's like to strike a ball with your weak foot, and sometimes it can just be a horrible, horrible thing when you're not uh, yeah. Mason Greenwood because you just don't have the same uh, confidence, the same control, the same uh, kind of muscle memory that you do in your strong foot that allows you to just, you know, ping balls away and um, no bother. And then suddenly it comes onto your left foot or your whatever is your weak foot and everything's just so awkward and uncoordinated and difficult. And we even see that with professionals. I mean, we see that with both of Iron Man Basaka's feet, but yep. <laughs> Greenwood just does not suffer from that in any way, shape or form. Like to, to get that crisp and, and, and true strike from his right, I thought was just fantastic. And also he just seems to eye up very quickly and very efficiently, which is the hallmark of a great finisher, the best way to score the goal with what you're looking at. And he just had that little corridor outside, um, I think Tyrone Mings, um, who was then on site in the goalkeeper. And he just thought, all I have to do is hit this ball completely straight and it'll go straight in this, you know, the side net there. And then he just yep. did it. And it's one thing to see it and, and kind of understand that that's the way you have to do it then just deliver it so so fantastically well and we see that and i think we'll see a whole range of finishes from him that to suit you know whatever particular chance he served up but pff, frightening frightening again i thought villa i mean extremely poor in terms of you know we heard those kind of bt clips from the bournemouth game of don't let him turn don't let him turn all that kind of stuff from ramsdale i mean to give him five yards of space on the edge of the box like that and and it was repeated for Pogba's goal. Um, it's just to me, uh, I think they were already slightly beaten after the, after the one nil pen. But it was just galling, you know. It was just it was just such a bad idea, knowing what we know about Mason Greenwood and his current form. And I I was just so surprised by it. Also, Dave Marshall on the build up that goal. I mean, that was unreal. That was, I was banging number nine player like unreal. I, I like that. I think it was Mings that he was kind of banging yeah wrestling with as yeah. well, right? Like this. There's a significant difference in size and strength there, but you would never have realised that the way Martel held the ball up. Yeah. And I think um, he sort of did like a little shimmy as well, and I can't yeah. remember who it was that took the ball from him. But it, in general, his hold-up play today was as good as I can remember it being. I might be forgetting some other like good performances of his because he's had way more had them way more often this season than before, especially in that role. But his, he he just looked like a like a proper number nine today that was happy to get involved happy to happy to chase back and his usage of the ball today and like he was I mean he, he created the penalty pretty much for Bruno yeah. he, without him uh, Greenwood doesn't score that goal he was involved in so much and it was just really really good to see like I think he's if he plays like that every game then we don't have a number nine problem it's as simple as that no absolutely not and I think you know what you saw for the the whole of playing that goal is is kind of everything we would ever have wanted from our show because on the one hand you got him with an increased presence and a bit of strength wrestling with Tyron Mings and coming out on top really nice on the halfway line turning actually getting bundled over but having the the kind of ability to still wriggle away with the ball and then showing his amazing quick feet which we've always known we have but when you begin to couple that with that kind of number nine Galloway-esque awareness and and hold up ability you then start to have a real, um, a really powerful tool, tool because it's almost cheat code stuff, you know, to have such good feet and to, and to also be able to put it alongside quality number nine ability. You know, you don't not to not to kind of say they're not unbelievably good players, but Kane Lewandowski, the best number nines in the world, tend not to be as strong dribblers. You know, but Martial really has everything in his locker, and when he does drift out to the left, 
and um, he can he can do devastating things like he um did against Bournemouth, you know. So he really can bring the full um the full package up there, and it's really pleasing to see him bring that kind of more classic number nine style into his game. It's it definitely bodes well. Um, so that was the half, and it, and it was all looking pretty good. We started the the second half, and I mean, it was just um, it was almost testimonial stuff. I think Villa, um, from the first goal looked like a team who were already relegated, or certainly were squaring away this game in terms of, uh, I think trying to minimise uh, goal difference and and rest a few players. Dean Smith said afterwards, I think everyone knew that the the, the tie was over essentially. Um, but then Paul, but I mean, I was really pleased. You know, I love a good corner routine. Very very makes me happy. <laughs> I mean, it's something we, yeah. we're so bad at corners that I think we may as well do the Man City thing of just basically taking them short and playing football, you know, because, I mean, I know, did Maguire score from a corner from a Bruno corner a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, he did. Was that against Norwich, sorry? Um, in the FA yeah, Cup I think so. Prior to that, I can't think of us looking in any way dangerous from corners, even though uh, Big Slabhead has had a, um, you know, his breakthrough season, but he, he hasn't been as prolific in front of goal as he was at Leicester, I don't think. Um, but this one, the short one, Bruno straight out. To the, I mean, again, you have to say Villa, like just given so much time and room to all of our really, really good footballers. Like, but it's a great finish. It's a great finish, and it's a like I think the pass from Bruno as well because he did have to squeeze it between a few bodies. Yeah. I don't know who it was. It was kind of like on the edge of the eighteen yarder, but but it's still like it's a tough pass to pull off. But the way that um, Villa got out to him, Grealish in particular. I mean, if you're the Aston Villa manager and you're not like going off your head at him for not showing a little bit more commitment and closing down the ball quicker, I mean, Pogba had time to take another touch before. I think he took three touches. Yeah, I think he took three touches on the edge of the box. That is just not acceptable at any level of football to not close someone down with that type of shooting ability. I mean, it's still an amazing finish, and Pogba has to bend it around the player and it's like Reina doesn't even dive. Like it's kinda kinda similar to Greenwood's goal in that way, that there was a player kind of screening the goal. And exactly. Like, yeah. it's, it's in, right? And I mean after the Greenwood goal, Pepe Reina gets up and goes absolutely apoplectic at Tyrone Mings because yeah. it takes away any chance for Reina to make the save. Because he's the ball's halfway to him before he's even seeing it, you know? And it gives the players those nice little as I said earlier, those corridors to kind of bend it in where you know as long as I it's it's almost like a marker, you know, it's almost like having a post before the post. And all you have yeah. to think is as as long as I bend it round him, it's probably gonna go in. Kind of, it just yeah. makes it so much easier. You know, it's like a it's like a a little line, a little course drawn out for you to, to kind of sling the ball down. So I mean I have a little sympathy for Pepperina and um, Aston Villa, goalkeeper who I did no play for Aston Villa, um, because <laughs> He was just let down twice and in such similar fashion. But I mean, you still have to pass it in, and Pogba, and it's so nice to see because it's such a, it's kind of like a, it almost feels kind of like you're taking the piss out of them a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like oh, I didn't have to hit it hard. I just kind of yeah, like like I was passing a twenty meter pass. Do you know what I mean? It was good to see Pogba pull off that kind of finish as well because you usually when Pogba hits it, he's putting more power than precision behind it. Like he's put, he's usually like puts his foot in the ball, rolls it in front of him, and then hits it pretty powerfully. This was just yeah, he does like, like to spank them, doesn't he? Pure placement. And it, to be fair to him, he spanks them well. I mean, what, a couple of seasons ago, he yeah, hit he the post yeah. like eight yeah. times for 45 yards. But yeah, he, yeah. he just placed it. He just he picked the right option, bend it around the player, and if it's on target, chances are it's a goal. But the, um, the thing that I loved about Pogba's goal was a celebration right after. Like, I, I'm a huge... Huge lover of bromance he's happening within the club, and seeing the way that Pogba and Bruno celebrated with each other, like we mm. we see it before their eyes how well they play in midfield together. But to know that it might be happening off the field as well, to the extent that they're really good buddies, and just it was just awesome to see. It was like that could be your like our midfield sorted for two three years with those two guys playing at that level together. It just, um, I don't know, I, I just got a buzz from those two enjoying that goal so much. And it's like they, they've obviously worked on it on training. Well, exactly. And that's that's the thing that I get a lot of pleasure from. I also think the, the coaching staff will be um, absolutely buzzing off that as well. But do you remember the um, Martial goal where Bruno, it was a free kick on the edge of the box and Bruno kind of Fred gave him a yeah. nod and then he scooped it over and Martial kind of shinned it, but a really good finish. Um, and it's it's that. That was one of my favourite goals just because 
A, we didn't do anything like that before Bruno came. He's clearly bringing that to the training ground and saying, look, why can't we mix these things in? And the corner routine is the same. Like, there's no way that was just a dynamic, a spontaneous situation, um, kind of like the, the Trent Alexander Arnold one, if you remember from yeah. last year where he just took it real quick. That's something that's been worked on. Pog was picking up that position um, purposefully because normally in corners, Pog was right in the mixer because he's a he's a, an aerial threat big time. Um, he doesn't tend to pick up on the outside of the box so that's something that's been thought about and worked on and to see it come you know the, in a professional premier league standard game of football chances to do those things are few and far between and having them work is even more rare you know normally speaking we're quite happy just to see the intent and um, but when it actually comes off it, it just feels even more special and there's with the corner united goodness they look menacing Pogba time to run at the shot and scores that's his first goal for 15 months and it's the fernandez Pogba partnership 3-0 that was his first goal since april 2019 so well over a year since his last goal and his, obviously it was his first goal this season i just thought that was mental because you forget that he just hasn't played he just has not played you know um and that's just mad to me it was a, I, I even had to check that like just since we returned from a like from lockdown was it he hasn't scored yet now that was out when I heard the commentator say that. That's a crazy stat to think. Yeah. And I know, like, I don't even know how many appearances he has since then. I mean, it would, we'd maybe be talking about about 20 or less total for the club. But yeah. it's still, yeah, that was crazy to think it's been that long since we've seen a pop a goal. Like. It also points towards when he did play a high reliant, we were on him because he's a player you expect to be up there with kind of over 10 goals, over 10 assists, while he's playing yep. a, a largely defensive midfield role, and, and particularly in a team that wasn't doing well before. And um, that's really interesting. I think not. You know, if, if this team keeps going with the, the personnel, personnel it has at the moment, I don't think Pogba will get anywhere near those numbers next year. Well, he might, but I wouldn't expect it, and I wouldn't be disappointed if he didn't, because that's I'm not really asking him to score goals. I don't really care if he scores goals, because there's four hugely credible goal threats in front of him that it means he doesn't actually need to you know chipping in is fantastic but now before it was such a um expectation and a demand being placed on him to do everything and now it's just not the case and that's the perfect situation for Paul Pogba to flourish I mean he was my man of the match I don't know generally on his performance but I just thought he was terrific today no he was it, it was it was one of his um it was just such a powerful performance on him. I mean obviously first half had a couple of sloppy moments but he's just when he turns it on it's just so obvious how much better he is than most other players playing in midfield like how how do you deal with that like the the package that he has as a footballer if he's on so it's just almost impossible to stop but I, I mean I would like to see him get more assists and I think he will next season I'm, I'm not as concerned about his goals but I think we'll probably see that towards the end of this season and, and if he stays with us hopefully Next season, we'll see his assist number go up as well because he's he's so creative, he's so inventive. Like there was a couple of passes that he tried as well that usually, like last season, if he tried, then you, you'd be like, oh, for God's sake, Pogba's trying something again. Now because the whole team is kind of responding a bit better to stuff like that, you're like, you know what, good attempt, good idea, right? And it's like you're almost forgiving him for trying some of the things that used to annoy you, and that's a great sign of how far he seems to be coming along mentally on the field like he looks like he's he cares he looks like he's happy to be there and most importantly he really looks like he's enjoying his football you could yeah. tell when Pogba wasn't enjoying playing in a game but now he just really looks like he's enjoying it and that's so important for that whole team because he's obviously a big personality he's obviously a very well liked guy in the dressing room like everyone seems to like any footage you see of the players they all seem to gravitate towards him so seeing him like turn it on on the field it's just a joy to watch man yeah, it absolutely is. He, he gave a very good post-match um, interview just at, at pitch side and um, spoke very well about Mason in terms of how good he is, but also what he needs to do, you know, knuckle down and, and that Paul enjoys playing one, but he's trying to teach him and, and kind of guide him and stuff like that. Came across really well. I mean, and then also just about what the team expects of itself now and, and that they aren't taking anything for granted or don't think they've made it and all that kind of stuff. And, and he just, I mean, his character's always been good in terms of interviewing and on the pitch and certainly teammates have always been I think effusive about um, his quality in terms of uh, as a human and um, it's, it's all the kind of paper talk brother talk agent talk I think that is and, and his kind of I guess unwillingness to maybe uh, stamp that out that has always caused the big issues I, I mean I assume and I hope we're approaching new contract territory 
um, which would be a massive, massive, massive boost for us um, and our ambitions moving forward. Um, and it, it just remains to be seen how quickly that can be done. I don't think it'll be done before the transfer window is kind of well underway. I think he'll want to see who's coming in and, and, and what the exact um, lay of the land is regards Champions League football is next year. Um, but, I mean, it, it has to be a huge priority for the club. My only issue is I think it's going to be eye water now. Yeah. And I just don't... I mean, I, I accept that there's probably no way around that. But, um, I mean, if you just... Like, and not just Pogba, but some of the money, some of our players, not just the hair, Marcus Rojo, even players who aren't anywhere near our squad, the kind of money we're on, I just think, as a club, we still have a big issue with our wage bill and, and, and the kind of culture that's been around the club in the last um, sort of six or seven years. So... To me, and, and I'm not saying Pogba's part of that, or that he doesn't deserve a huge contract. I mean, he's already on a massive one, and um, so what's another, you know, fifty grand a week? Maybe you would say, but it's just one of those things, you know. But I, you can't help but hope that he signs on the dotted line ASAP, because as you say, watching those kind of partnerships and and kind of the confidence that gives you for next year is just is huge, you know. Yeah, the the thing with the the contracts as well is like what what type of position does that put us in with Greenwood, right? I mean, yeah. He's um he's obviously like right now he's he's been talked as the a generational talent, the best teenager like in world football, like so many accolades already. Yeah. I mean it does put the put all the chips in his favour in terms when he comes to the negotiating table. You think a local lad came through the academy, hopefully money's not gonna matter to him quite as much, but when you see when you see Sanchez's impact and how much money yeah. he got paid. And you look at Greenwood's impact and like what he's on right now, it's probably like five percent of what Sanchez is getting paid by us right now. And Sanchez is out of sight, out of mind, but he's still very much um, financially uh, happy in, in a huge yeah. way, you know. And I think that kind of goes under the radar slightly. The other person I would throw into that conversation, I think Bruno's on like sixty, seventy grand a week. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> which is, and, and that, that obviously speaks to uh, the Portuguese league and the particular finance struggles at Lisbon, but also I think to Bruno's um, personality and mentality that it, it just doesn't matter as much to some players as others. You get the feeling with Bruno that he would he'd play yeah, for a five or a game. Exactly, yeah. And I don't want to get drawn it's into just, like an ethical debate. You know, the players are worth that money. I fully believe that. They don't control the money in football. They're just the recipient of it. And it's totally fine. You know, it's totally fine. Um, but Bruno is the guy in that team for me. You know, again, pretty pretty average performance by his own lofty standards. Saying he came away with a golden assist, I thought most of what he tried didn't really come off. But still, he is the spark. He is that enigmatic, uh, always trying something. That player, the teams will be so fearful, and the work ethic is just frightening, absolutely frightening. That even you know, and we've seen it probably the last two games. Even when he has maybe what we would call blow power performance, he's unbelievably unbelievably industrious and unbelievably productive in terms of goals and assists and and, and chance creation it, it's just frightening like he almost maybe that is just a good game for him and, and we just have kind of too high expectations but even when he's wasting passes and, and, and kind of playing things that aren't coming off i just don't feel like i'll ever get sick of it i don't even ever think i'll think oh you shouldn't have tried that and go mad you know whereas we previous as you spoke about earlier you know we sometimes used to get frustrated at pope but trying certain passes or whatever but to me Bruno just has free reign to do what he wants. And if it's totally ridiculous and doesn't work, I'm just like, do you know what? It'll probably work the next time he tries it. No, I'm the same. I guess we were looking for a difference maker and we found one. We were looking for someone that could help us against the teams that would sit in deep. And we found one. Like Aston Villa, like they're, sure they're fighting relegation, sure they want to win, but any time they come up against Man United with that group of players, they're going to think we are second best here. But if we just sit in, we might get something from the game. Can't do that with Bruno on the field. He just can't. He'll find a way. He'll keep coming at you. And if he doesn't, he's made the space for someone else to do that. Just as industry, as I don't know how you measure that in terms of statistics, but as industry is something that we were severely lacking. And the best thing is, is he's, the other players are seeing it and doing the same. I mean, I... I saw Martial chase the ball more today than I think I did last season combined. Yeah, I think like it is. It just, and that's coming off the effect of Bruno, right? It's uh, so refreshing to see. And the fact that he's not getting paid quite as much money as some of the stars, quote unquote, it, it can, that kind of annoys me because I, I want it to be fair on him. And I think the quality on the field should be reflected in your salary. And that might be a conversation for another time. But the, the guy is just like, he's, he's rejuvenated the team. Even other fans are like kind of like he's almost like their second uh, 
Man United will never be their second team, but Bruno yeah. will be like one of the players that they kind of, you know what, I, I appreciate what he's done and what type of guy he is. Like, he's, just, he's just a superstar. It's simple. He's a superstar. He's what we needed and he's rejuvenated that team in a way I did not think one solitary signing could do. No. Um, well, you mentioned it there in terms of Martial's work ethic and we've already spoken about how good he was today and his kind of all-around number nine-ness. Um, but he didn't look so happy when he subbed off. Anthony's getting fitter and fitter, and he uh, he could could have lasted the game, of course. Um, and he's starting every game, so uh, I'd be more worried if he wanted to come off. Uh, everyone wants to be a part of the team, part on uh, be on the pitch. So, and he's put a shift in. So, it's uh, that's fine. It's great for me to have him uh, available to to start every game. He's obviously wants to score, and yeah. I feel like. And the way I don't know what the the commentators were like where you were watching, but they kind of they made a big deal of uh, whenever Rashford got a chance, like he had a free kick, and I think he had another chance. They cut the camera back to Martial, yeah, and yeah. he was still looking really moody. Yeah. And it was almost as if like there was this competition going on between them because they're quite close in the goal scoring charts. So as opposed to being like upset that he was taken off, like or like annoyed, pissed off. I feel like it was just more, oh, like I want to win like this kind of mini competition we have going on in house. Um, but he's never looked happy when he comes off. Like even if he scored two goals and he comes off, he's still like, no, I wanted to get the hat trick. The guy clearly just prefers being in a football field, and that's exactly what you want. But the thing from Martial before is that when he used to come off and sulk, you weren't sure if he was going to start the next game because he hadn't given a, a good performance. Yeah. Whereas now it's like, he will be in the team against Southampton, leading the line, guaranteed. Like, there's just no doubt about that right now. So I feel like he's he just wants to play football. But before it was, he's coming off and he played kind of shit. So yeah. now we're not getting that, especially after today. Like, I mean, Pogba was probably, I agree, man of the match. Martial would be running a very, very close second. I thought he was phenomenal today. I think that's a very good point in that how we view things is so flipped now you know it's so dependent on how the team's performing and there's been a long talk of martial's moodiness his body language we get all the experts on saying this that and the other but the one thing that you can't deny is that that, that is a part of his personality you know he's quite reserved in many ways yeah, look at when he celebrated the did you see the video when rashford scored the the penalty yeah. against psg and martial yeah. was at home that didn't look like a happy guy celebrating to me it yeah. was like an angry celebration yeah. Yeah, he's, but that's just. I think you know we've we've sort of just come to expect that he's just a bit of an oddball in, in that sense. Yeah. I think you know and that's just his manner and his way. And it's often he's been not a smiler. He's not a smiler, but it's often been misconstrued as as a negative, you know, a, a moodiness, a a downness, and, and a and a, maybe a lack of uh, you know passion. And, and 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 people would question how much he cares or how much it means or how much he's motivated and all that kind of stuff, which is probably unfair. But that was coloured by how we were playing at the time and, as you say, how he was playing. And the fact that you maybe then wouldn't see him in the next game or the game after that or the game after that. And whether that's his fault, the current manager's fault, sorry, the, the manager at that time's fault, the general team around him's fault. You know, these are big debates that have been happening lately in terms of, you know, was he the same player all along and we just had a poor team around him or was he being mismanaged, all the rest of it? That, was it because Ole's put him in at number nine? Was he trusted him with all the starts and we've now got three or four players around him who are you know, on the wavelength and, and able to kind of provide for him? Um, and, it's, and it probably is a mix of all those things, but it was just interesting because he was unhappy and, and, and Solskjaer was kind of laughing and joking him on the side of the pitch and he, he wasn't having any of it. Like, But I agree with you. I mean, I don't mind. Like, it's, when he's played well and when we know he's going to start next week and or on Monday and score probably, it's very easy just to shrug that off. It's a non-event. If anything, it's just a little endearing, funny thing that happened in the match kind of thing, you know. Um, but I agree. I thought Sky cutting to his face about 18 times in the remaining 20 was minutes was, was slightly unnecessary. Like, I mean, there's only so much flogging of that I think you can do. I thought it was pretty um, pretty obvious what the what angle they were going for there. Yeah. Um, but he was fantastic. Um, someone who was maybe not so fantastic, um, although I am a big fan, and I know you are not, uh, was Jack Grealish. Um, who I thought we might just talk about um, for a little bit because he is, you know, we, Nick doesn't like us to delve too much into transfer rumors when the football's still going on. He doesn't even really like when we do it uh, in the summer in the transfer windows. But I think we can indulge ourselves a little bit here, David. He is, I would say, one of the two players most likely to come to United this summer. I think Jaden Sancho is obviously a huge one and all being well, it can be negotiated and, and it'll 
uh, it'll happen or at least you know we'll, we'll we'll know one way or another and i think also first of all i think villa are definitely going down and i think that only increases the chances that we buy jack Grealish, and um, who we have um throughout the season been linked to um, as someone that we like and that we're interested in um, but you're not a fan really i'm not a fan quick question for you does he get in our first team right now? Uh, not right now. Um, I think he is an extremely good backup, and I don't think he'd necessarily be happy with that, but he'd definitely come to United. And I would say, look, he'd play the games where we need to rest players and we have a mad schedule. And I wouldn't be surprised say, if he came in the summer and we played our first 20 games. I would not be surprised if he'd worked his way into the team because I do believe he has an extremely good character. Um, not for COVID breaches and uh, extracurricular activities necessarily, but I mean on the football pitch, he has an extremely good character about him. I think he has an extremely good drive, uh, a desire to take responsibility, which is extremely positive. And I think that's coupled with really good, you know, quality, technical ability. Um, so I, I don't think he would start for us immediately. It's impossible to drop any of those fronts four. And I don't think he fits in the midfield too all that well. I'd want to see him much higher up the pitch if he was playing at Manchester United. But... I, I would not be surprised if he worked his way in there somehow, you know. And ultimately, I don't care. I'm, I don't know that we're, you know, outside of Sancho, I don't know that we're getting, and maybe a centre-back, I don't know that you can get any starters with this team, you know. And it's a, to me, it's like a, it's a bit of a funny one because even people have been saying, maybe we don't need Sancho. Greenwood's the best player ever. And, you know, Greenwood <laughs> might be the best player ever. There's no way to progress as a football team by saying what we have is absolutely perfect and we don't need to do anything. Let's put all our eggs in the 18-year-old basket. It's just daft. Even if Greenwood is nailed down right wing, you just need strength and depth. You need quality. And it's a statement to, to the team, to the other clubs, to world football, to say we are wanting to challenge at the highest level. Because And the only way you can do that is by having world-class players behind world-class players. You know, So to me, it's an, it's an, I don't see it as a big consideration we need to improve the squad and whether that's the first team or the squad behind it then i think Grealish comes either way i think he would fancy himself to get in the team and even if he acknowledges that he'll maybe be on the bench a bit he still comes to united i think all day every day like when you said you in terms of his personality and his character on the field and his, his willingness to take responsibility if i'm going into the last four or five games of the season and my team who, and I think Grealish has always been at Villa. I, I don't think he came, he came through their academy, right? So he's, he's came up, he's a Villa guy, and you're trying to fight off relegation. The character and the commitment to the cause and the willingness to take responsibility, and, and granted, I mean, obviously Man United right now are the best team ever in the history of the game, so it's difficult <laughs> to stand out against us. But... I didn't see a single shred of that today. Now, I was watching the game today with a little, an eye on Grealish to say, well, can you stand out against us again? Because he, he did stand out against us in the reverse fixture at home. Yeah. He scored that wonderful goal. Like, and then you say, like, you know what, that's a player there. But since the return of football, and kind of leading up to that as well, his statistics aren't that impressive, but it's his... His attitude during COVID, I mean, you can't overlook that. I mean, you, you you only get so much of a glimpse into a player's personality off the field. Mm. And the ones that broke the regulations, like you see, like Kyle Walker, I mean, it's pretty, the way Kyle Walker plays football and acts in a field, you can probably tell he's not the, not the most likable character in the game. But when you see Grealish doing what he did during lockdown, and I don't even think they got to the bottom of the, the true story, if it was like drink related, if it was drink driving, or yeah. just had like a gathering with a couple of mates, I don't know what it was. But to me, it's a, it's a red flag on his personality. Because the thing Solskjaer has done better than anything else is get that dressing room liking each other and getting them committed to the cause. And I was watching for that from Grealish today. What are you going to do to stop your team being relegated because you're clearly the best player on your team but like you've demonstrated that over and over you're the creative outlet you're a goal scorer when you want to be and you just know how to turn it on against opposition and make yourself look at one of the better players in the park and I, I don't even think he was close to being Aston Villa's best player today and they were poor yeah. all over the park I just didn't see enough from him and you you just like the way I mean, it's, a, it's probably a bad comparison, but the way Ronaldo played for Sporting Lisbon when he came up against us in a friendly, for the, the amounts of money being talked about that we would spend on Jack Grealish, and I know that that will change if Villa go down, 
if they go down. But we're still talking like probably a minimum of a forty million pound player. You need to stand out more, and you definitely need to have came back from lockdown with a much better mentality because that shows you so much about what a player is mentally capable of, how they deal with that amount of time off football, what they do during it, and what they're like when they come back. And Grealish has been, he's been like non-existent since he came back. I know Graham Souness had a go at him last weekend saying like, if, um, if this is a player who is getting fouled the most in the league, He's probably not moving the ball on quick enough. And mm. I'm not saying Sunez has a point there because I think like if you're getting filled more than anyone else, it's probably because your team are giving you the ball because you're the one who's most likely to do damage. But it's just it's his commitment to the cause today. I, I didn't see enough of it. I don't know if he has one foot out the door already. Maybe the agents have been in touch with each other. The club has been in touch with him. Maybe Solskjaer has the way that he was saying to Nathan Ake, like, oh, we, we need a left-footed centre-back. Maybe Solskjaer was saying, we need a good backup on the bench. But right now, that's all I could ever see Grealish being as, a, as an impact substitute. He doesn't get anywhere near a first team. And for the price that's being quoted for him and the add-on the ten million million for being a young English talent, I don't think he's worth it. I'd rather spend the money elsewhere. And in this current climate, to get Jack Grealish means we don't address a more important position on the field. If you can get him for a cut price, 15, 20 million, there's not much of a gamble there. And he does have the potential to be a great player. I've seen enough from him. His technical ability is borderline world-class at times. I don't have an issue with Jack Grealish, the potential football player. I do have an issue with Jack Grealish, the potential fit for Man United. I don't think it goes, and I think we should steer clear, trust what we already have on that side of the park, kind of the left-hand creative side, and look elsewhere, spend the money elsewhere. I, I just don't think he fits in. Well, I mean, I, I suppose there's a few wee bits I disagree there in terms of just personally about Jack Grealish and stuff like that, and him on the pitch, and him with Villa. I think that's a tough ask, particularly I mean, post-lockdown. They've just been devoid of any kind of creativity and I, they look a bit rudderless to me at the moment and I think they're down and I think a lot of their players know they're down I think that was what we saw today when they went 1-0 down and I don't think he's exempt from that and I take your point that it's not you know it's not outstanding but I also think there's only so much you can do in certain teams you know and I think he's it looks to me like he's given everything and he's kind of done with Villa a wee bit I think he knows he's leaving and it's not ideal it's not amazing but it's not nice I think to be kind of nailed on for relegation either but the point that i absolutely do agree on is i think there's probably four positions i'd rather buy than another creative midfielder to be to be honest i'd rather a dm i'd rather a white ringer i'd rather a center back and i'd rather a, a left back probably to be honest um so it's it's i think it's one that will happen i just have this weird feeling that it's kind of gonna happen and i i do think it could be a very good sign for us but i do agree that it's i don't think it's a priority in any way shape or form and if anything it gives a little bit of a selection headache to some very good players who will all want to play a lot of minutes and um, that's that's about all the the transfer talk we can uh, elbow into this podcast and anyway. <laughs> um, so we have uh southampton on monday um which looking at um you know our remaining fixtures up to leicester looks like the tricky one not including the fa cup tie against chelsea obviously and um, but this is i mean southampton coming off a 1-0 victory against wasn't it 1-0 against city che adam scored from silly out you know yep. Ederson doing the old scott mctominay thing of just not being in his net and um, yeah and Danny Ings, I think today scored again. They drew one-one with Everton. Um, I mean, we kind of just have to hope that not have to hope. But obviously, yeah, look, we're a better team than Southampton, but they are decent, very decent. The only thing now is they, I don't know oh, what their situ- situation is with Europa League and stuff like that. But I don't think they have much to play for. Um, but it's Monday night. What What do you reckon? Are you same lineup, and, and what, how do you think we'll go? I think we'll probably go with the same lineup. I don't see. I don't see any reason to change it. Um, I do. Southampton have looked good. Um, Danny Ings is kind of, I think he's found the type of team he needs to be the main man at. I think his move to Liverpool was a bit premature. And obviously he was doing well, but he's a team like Southampton, like probably guaranteed going to finish top 10 in the league. I think that's where he where he's going to shine and never at a level beyond that. But I really, really like um and excuse the pronunciation, uh, the manager hasn't at all. Like he's, he's um, from what I've read about him, he'd be the type of, done the kind of similar to Solskjaer in lockdown. Like make sure you come back ready. Make sure that you're uh, 
you're doing the work that you need to be doing when we're not monitoring you the way that we normally do, Monday to Friday. Just come back mentally and physically prepared and we're, we'll do well. And I think they've seen that and they came back. And obviously they're taking, they beat Man City. And I know, I, just, I mean, they wasn't, um, I don't think Man City deserved to get beat that game per no. se, but the confidence that that gives the Southampton team turning up at Old Trafford with no support there, I think, um, like I say, this, this is the most tricky game that we have up until we play Leicester. But I still think if, if we start the game on the front foot, they can't live with us. The, the Southampton defence is nothing special and I just don't think that they can live with be two of the three being on. Like if it's Martel and Rashford, Martel and Greenwood, Greenwood and Rashford, whatever. If two of the three are on, I think it pushes them back and I don't think they have enough creativity um, coming from the midfield to supply Danny Ings the way that he needs. We don't have to worry about a physical, like tall striker playing against him, so that should play into Maguire and Lindelof's hands because they sometimes struggle with that extra physicality. Um, so, I, I mean, I would expect us to win. Just, I mean, for what seventeen games unbeaten and mm. best team in the world. So, yeah. at home, expecting us to win. But Southampton are a, they're quite easy on the eye. I quite enjoy watching them, and I do like the manager. The manager is. Um, Definitely one of the the better ones of the kind of also runs in the Premier League. I think they're well placed for the future as well. And just what Southampton have done over like the past like couple of decades, academy wise, and the way that the club has been run, got a lot of respect for them. Would we'll never take them as just turning up and expect to win because on their day they can beat Man City, right? Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of those thoughts. Um, interestingly, after their nine nil defeat to Leicester earlier in the season. They've just been a, a completely different team. But Leicester had as many shots as Man City had in the one nil lost in, in that nine nil victory. As yeah. many shots, as many shots on target as Man City. So Man City absolutely should have won that game. But you, you know, the result is the result. And um, I agree, Hassan Hulo or however you say his name, um quite impressive. I didn't actually pay much attention to him um prior to lockdown but but since coming out of lockdown I sort of have and he's he's kind of almost like a, a mini clop he's much more expressive um and rambunctious on the sideline than I had previously get him given him credit for and he has them really well organized they're another super fit super organized super all pulling in the same way team and I think that just straight away makes them tough to play against and then they just have that little sprinkling of quality with um Danny Ings and like Nathan Redmond and stuff like that um but I think it's going to be comfortable. I think we. I think I agree. I think we'll just have too much for them, and I actually think we will um, just be pretty comfortable with it. I'm expecting another another good win, um, and I agree. I don't think he'd change the lineup too much. I think that was quite a, a comfortable game for us in terms of um, energy expended and our recovery and stuff like that. A lot of um, good early subs made, and and Wambasaka, I think in getting a bit of a rest was was a good decision to bring Brandon on um, and give him 30 minutes, um, which he, he certainly deserves. But also I thought, well, I'm sick of look leggy through it, um, which is fair because he's covered, he covers insane ground and, and has played all the minutes. Um, and then everyone else got a bit of a rest as well, so I wouldn't expect too many changes. But I'm expecting um, another good performance and everything to keep rolling on. Yep, absolutely. And we have an extra day's rest as well. We play Monday, so it's... Yeah, exactly, and I think that makes it just a little bit more comfortable. I mean, the only bad thing about that is all the other games go ahead and you're, you know, kind of maybe chasing, or but then we could have a boost with another, um, you know, gain in points, I suppose. You know, there's no way to discount that. I think we're now a point behind Leicester, two points behind Chelsea, I think, um, which is, I mean, that is touching distance, like, you know, so all to play for. Um, we will be back uh, most likely Tuesday or Wednesday after that um, Southampton game all being well. Um, but as for tonight, that's cheerio for me. Yep, cheerio for me as well. Take care, folks.